Always get your man? Of course. Think you'll get me? In a hurry? In a worry? Quit. Thomas Crown is somewhat of an enigma. <laughs> it is a caper film. It's about a love affair in the middle of a very dangerous circumstance. Is it truly style over content? It's suspense, sexy. He is, in essence, a criminal. And uh, she is the law. In 1966, a lawyer named Alan Trustman wondered what it would be like to rob the bank across the street from his office. After months of meticulously planning the perfect crime, Trustman used the idea as the basis of his first movie script. Work an hour, you do an errand, you drive a car. Is it, is it uh, dangerous? It's in it for me. Fifty. Thousand. In a hurry? In a worry? Quit. Tentatively titled The Crown Caper, it told the story of a millionaire businessman named Thomas Crown who has grown tired of life at the top. Retire? You? Now, that wouldn't be an easy matter. Well, just knock off for a bit, Sandy. Perhaps a trip around the world. He decides to steal millions of dollars from a Boston bank just for the thrill of it. <laughs> After the robbery, Crown is pursued by a sexy and sophisticated insurance investigator determined to get her man. She's following him closer all the time. Let's cover his phones. Squeeze him. Keep the pressure on. All right. I'll squeeze. You'll squeeze. And so will he. The script was snapped up by Norman Jewison, Oscar-winning director of In the Heat of the Night. And I just got fascinated with the character of Thomas Crown and, and with this kind of terse, uh, not very dramatic dialogue. There was, was a lot of rhyming words in it. Money isn't funny. <laughs> the script also caught the eye of one of Hollywood's hottest actors, Steve McQueen star of The Cincinnati Kid and The Great Escape. He came to me on Thomas Crown. He said he wanted to play the part. And I said, Steve, come on. Uh, you've never played a part where you wore a tie. Uh, I've never seen you in a suit and tie. He says, that's why I want to do it. I want, you, I want to be this guy. With Steve McQueen on board, the search was on to find a perfect match for businessman turned bank robber Thomas Crown. Actress Faye Dunaway, who would literally shoot to fame in Bonnie and Clyde, was the director's only choice to play glamorous investigator Vicki Anderson. You practically said I had something to do with the... No, I said it. You're finding out just what I've got. What a funny, dirty little line. It's a funny dirty little job. So shoot me in the leg. Always get your man? Of course. Think you'll get me? I hope so. I just thought that this woman had everything uh, that I wanted for, for, certainly for Thomas Crown. And, um, you know, she was tall, she was beautiful, she had the high cheekbones, and she was, her comedic timing was, I thought, brilliant, and she was very sophisticated. You know what you are. I know what I am. Don't put your labels on me, Eddie. Go. The Thomas Crown Affair began filming in Boston in June 1967 one of the first films to be shot on location. The daring daylight robbery was filmed with hidden cameras capturing the action. 
Only the actors knew they were being filmed. All the customers' reactions were real. For even greater authenticity, Jewison hoped to film in the local FBI offices, but after reading the script, they declined to be involved. This is an outrageous portrayal of the FBI, which depicts a bureau bank robbery investigation being taken over completely by a young girl who uses her physical charms to conduct her mission. I do my job. Your job? What the hell kind of a job is that? All right, Eddie, I'm immoral. So is the world. I'm here for the money, okay? Faye Dunaway's stunning wardrobe for the film was highly influential on the fashion of the time. More than 30 costumes were provided by designer Thea Van Runkel. You do live very well, don't you? No complaints. Perhaps the film's most famous scene is the sexually charged chess game played between Steve McQueen and Faye Dunaway. They're in his beautiful townhouse in Boston. He looks at her and says, Do you play? And she looks at him and says, Try me. And chess with sex then ensues. That's all it was. So that, you know, we spent two days shooting this, <laughs> this chess game, which we tried to make into an erotic, romantic, interesting piece of cinema. Although originally written as only two lines in the script, the chess game would become one of the most memorable scenes of 60s cinema. Off screen, the chemistry between the two stars was equally potent. He really felt challenged by her, I think. And I had a chat with her. And I said, he's going to make a big pass at you. <laughs> resist. <laughs> See if you can resist uh, his uh, overtures. Which he did, I think. <laughs> You'll have to ask Faye. Uh, anyway, the relationship, um, boy, it stayed right, right there all the way through the film. It really playing with each other. Released at cinemas in 1968, the Thomas Crown Affair became an instant box office success grossing $14 million from a $4 million budget. Beautiful. The movie's chart-busting title song, Windmills of Your Mind, went on to win an Academy Award for Best Song. Round like a circle in a spiral, like a wheel within a wheel, never ending or beginning on a never spinning reel, like a snowball down a mountain or a carnival balloon. Like a carousel that's turning, running rings around the moon. I think of all the songs that's ever been written for any of my films, this captured the character uh, perhaps better than, than any other, uh, both lyrically and melodically. In the windmills of your mind. Despite some initial reservations, Steve McQueen's performance as the gentleman thief was acclaimed by audiences and critics alike. Today, the film is widely recognized as the classic 60s caper movie. And action! It was only a matter of time before someone would revisit the story of Thomas Crown. I did it once. I can do it again. Good. Cut, please. Hold on. Let's swing this camera. And then I do the circle. Right. Go around.
Almost 30 years after the success of the Thomas Crown Affair, actor Pierce Brosnan, star of the James Bond films, first considered the idea of an update of Norman Jewison's classic movie. Let's play ball. Good morning, Mr. Crown. Good morning, good, good morning, morning one Crown. and all. Good morning, Mr. Crown. John, welcome back. Good morning, Mr. Crown. Good morning. Give me good numbers, Jimmy. Good morning, Daria. Good morning, Mr. Crown. You forgot your briefcase, right? No, I must have left it here last night. It's a film that I grew up with, and my partner, Beau St. Clair, and I, when she, we were working on our first film called The Nephew. We were having coffee one morning and um, came up with the idea of doing a remake. You look wonderful. Thank you. How are you? Popular. And I thought, this character is Pierce. He could play this. And you're thinking about moving someone away from Bond or making that tr transition, Pierce and I talked a lot about it, and it seemed like a really natural one step away from Bond. He's rich, elegant. I think it takes the audience from Bond, and they'll go with him to go to this place because of this character. I saw him wreck a $100,000 boat because he liked the splash. Not only would Pierce Brosnan take the starring role as Thomas Crown, he would also act as producer. I never really th thought about, you know, the 90s and bring it up into the 90s. I just, you know, if you follow your gut instincts and what you want to do emotionally, then hopefully the rest will follow up along. Is it more fun getting it than keeping it? But if Pierce Brosnan was nervous about producing a film of this scale, stepping into Steve McQueen's shoes was an equally daunting prospect. I had great trepidation in doing it because even though I saw that I could fit myself into this role, you are going into Steve McQueen territory. I mean, he was the king of cool, and he was a cinematic and is a cinematic icon of what he did. Uh, no one else did, did it like McQueen. Whoa! Let's make it interesting, shall we? It's a beautiful Saturday morning, John. What the hell else have we got to do? I don't think it was so much about doing a Steve McQueen movie as it was, like, doing a great play. You just see great characters and a great idea. And I'd like to think it was we were inspired by the original but that we didn't want to take anything away from them. Rather than simply remaking the Thomas Crown Affair, the filmmakers wanted to update the story for a more sophisticated 90s audience. And cut, please, good. This is very much about bringing this idea into the 90s, and that's why the emotional subtext is very different. Mr. Crown? I'm sorry. Women. You've yet to talk about women. Oh, I enjoy women. Enjoyment isn't intimacy. And intimacy isn't necessarily enjoyment. I mean, if we wanted to put the lens right, say, here, and just do an arm move and do that. The filmmakers made several fundamental changes to the original, switching the scene of Thomas Crown's crime from a bank to one of New York's most famous art museums. You'd like to have that? Why? Would you get it for me? Anything's obtainable. Good, cut, please. With an updated script in place, Die Hard director John McTiernan was everyone's first choice to direct the new version. Once we got John McTiernan on board for this film, that's it, we had the movie. Take the camera way up. You got this low mark. And action. John McTiernan read it, apparently overnight, loved it and committed it. He'd worked to it, he'd worked with Pierce on Nomads, so they had this great history. No, 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 no. He was just out of the AFI and the American Film Institute. And you could see then that he had this edge of storytelling. You never knew where the camera was going to come from. Okay, come. Now, uh, raise the camera another three inches. John talked to us about the script. He came in with an intuitive, innate understanding. He really clicked with exactly where we were with it and, had, and actually did nothing but want to move it forward. And he's really smart. It has the, the virtue or the embarrassment or the whatever of having the same name and a similar plot. Um, but when, I, when they sent me the script, I realized it was a different story. Here is a film which starts with the heist, and you want 
the audience to just be right there from the beginning. And he is a man that gets an audience's attention. This painting is considered to be the first Impressionist work in history. It's worth a hundred million bucks. <laughs> Most fun days for the actors are the days when they have to go do all that stuff. Okay, cut please. For the filmmakers, finding an actress to play opposite Pierce Brosnan was equally challenging. They found her in Rene Russo, star of Get Shorty and Lethal Weapon 4. This is an elegant crime done by an elegant person. It's not about the money. Rene is someone who I admired from afar, whose work I've enjoyed. I always think she's got an accessibility and a femininity and a strength and a, and a sense of humor about herself within her work and how she addresses herself on screen. And I thought that would go well together. Are you trying to, uh, <laughs> are you trying to imply that I had something to do with that painting? Trying. Thank you. No, I wouldn't call it an attempt. What's your take from this? 5% of the value recovery. Oh. Bounty hunter. If you like. Always get your man? Mm-hmm. Think you'll get me? Oh, I hope so. I wanted an actress that the audience could fall in love with, and that, that's the universal thing that every time she's been out, every movie she's in, no matter what she's playing, the audience falls in love with her. Um, and I figured that was a, you know, a requisite in a love story is that, you know, before they can fall in love with each other, the audience individually has to love each other. Rene Russo would play Catherine Banning, an updated version of the investigator previously played by Faye Dunaway. You can take a hundred million off the wall and waltz right out the front door. Oh, that's good. Faye Dunaway has a, a wonderful magic, and Steve McQueen had his, and together the chemistry was wonderful, and they had what they had. And I, I so I, I wouldn't, we couldn't duplicate that. So, and going into a film, you never know what the chemistry will be with another person. You kind of have to go in and trust, and it's, it, it's, you, it's about the director and your leading man and yourself, and you never know if it'll fizzle or go flat, or you don't know what the chemistry will be. May I ask you a very personal question? Why not? Would you like another hit of espresso? Would you like another? Like another hit of espresso? Hmm. That's the very personal question. That's as good as it gets. Oh, <laughs> excuse me. May I ask you a very personal question? Oh, sure, by all means. Do you really think I'm going to sleep with the man I'm investigating? Hmm? <laughs> In the original movie, once they screwed, they, um, the, f the fire went out between the two of them. Suddenly, Faye Dunaway was laying on the bed next to him, and it was like, it was over. That was something that I didn't want to happen. So, I mean, I, I think you'll see in this movie that it only really gets started once they Playful tribute to the original film, Faye Dunaway was cast as Thomas Crown's psychiatrist. What's happened? Happened? Whenever I talk, while you're tuning out what I say, the corners of your mouth go up. You're enjoying something. It's not me. What is it? An entertainment. Very little entertains you, so I can easily guess. A worthy adversary? Hmm? Did someone swindle you? Uh, people have asked me, uh, how did you possibly get Faye to do this? It, it wasn't hard. Um, 
I don't know, I took her to dinner and said, would you do this? I'd love to have you do it. She said, yeah. If you found a female mirror image and think you're going to form a rewarding relationship. Think again? I thought it was a very clever, bright idea. And when she said yes, then that gave us also a great affirmation and confirmation that, you know, we had a good script. Rounding out the supporting cast was comedian and actor Dennis Leary as Detective Michael McCann. You waltz in there without even a heads up, without one word to me, or anyone else in the department for that matter. I, uh... Had a little chat with him, yes. He had a little chat. He told them balls out he was a suspect. I cut through the crap, all right? I'm at w work at the precinct with all these guys that I've probably worked with for years for this woman to walk in the middle of it. I mean, of course she would all of a sudden just go, oh my God, I wish she was here every day. And it's very smart. I really think it's, uh, it's fun to watch Pierce angling his way through his relationship with her and, uh, and my character trying to get a break. Despite some changes to the storyline, Several scenes from the original film were kept relatively intact. Like a in a I could get used to this. Okay, just hold on now. Hold on, why? <laughs> Even the Oscar-winning song, Windmills of Your Mind, was re-recorded for the new film by British singer-songwriter Sting. After several weeks filming in New York, the cast and crew flew to the exotic Caribbean island of Martinique for the scene set at Thomas Crown's holiday hideaway. You're transferring assets, getting ready to run. And suppose I did run, then what would you have? Not the painting, but the $5 million fee, not me. Yes. Suppose I gave you 10. <laughs> After nearly three years of preparation, principal photography and post-production, the Thomas Crown Affair was released at U.S. Cinemas in August 1999. Switch the paint. Oh, that's good. Stay with them. The new film earned more in its opening weekend than the original made in its entire box office run. It's not about the money. So just how big of a thief are you? Dazzling audiences and critics all over again. It's a love story between a pair of crocodiles. And whose head are you after? Yours. Thomas Crown was back in business. Circles that you find. 